Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Doug Berkey, Executive Director for the Mitchell Institute, and welcome to our Nuclear Deterrence Forum Series. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Brad Roberts with us today. Dr. Roberts is a director of the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. He's the author of The Case for U.S. Nuclear Weapons in the 21st Century, and recently released a follow-up effort entitled On Theories of Victory, Red and Blue. From 2009 to 2013, he served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy. In this role, he served as a Policy Director of the Obama Administration's Nuclear Posture Review and the Ballistic Missile Defense Review. Sir, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to start by asking you to give an overview of your new monograph. Could you please explain the genesis of the report, review some of its key arguments, and provide some insight into the reception you've received? Doug, thanks so much for the opportunity to do so. Uh, thank you for the leadership of the Mitchell Institute and in forging a dialogue on these important topics. Uh, thanks to everyone who's online for your interest in joining in the conversation today. Uh, let me begin with a disclaimer that uh, I'm representing my personal views. Please don't attribute them to the laboratory or any of its sponsors. Uh, this work has a long background that long predates my arrival at the laboratory a few years ago. The genesis of this work really goes back to a period when I was in the Pentagon, slogging down those long polished corridors, arriving in a, in a, a locked suite, and finding that binder on the, on the desk of the, the, the daily intel take, the daily dose of bad news about everything that had happened in the last 24 hours or so on adversary nuclear and ballistic missile developments. And over time, I came to feel that there was something missing from that binder. The binder was very good at specifying the what was underway, but not the why. Uh, there, there was no clear understanding of uh, why these capabilities were be being brought together and what, what, what they would imply in the way of some new strategy that these adversaries could then execute with these capabilities in hand. So I set off on a, a search to better understand how nuclear armed adversaries think about and plan for conflict with the United States and its allies. Uh, and uh, the, the book of uh, six years ago sets out some preliminary thinking about that, but this new monograph, uh, which is available at the CGSR website, um, sets out a, a, a more detailed set of arguments. Uh, we learned a great deal in exploring this topic. Uh, for Russia, China, and North Korea, of course, while we were focused on the central problem of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, they were focused on their central problem, which is us, or at least so they perceive it. And generally speaking, their views of the United States as an adversary took shape in the 1990s uh, when our attention shifted off of the Soviet bipolar confrontation, uh, when we ascended to a, a, a high place in a unipolar system, uh, and we pursued a strategy of enlargement and engagement, which closed uh, societies and authoritarian leaders saw as threatening to them. Uh, and they watched the US military perform stunningly well uh, in, in, in Iraq, in Kosovo, uh, and for the Chinese also the operation, the dispatch of two carrier battle groups to the Taiwan Strait was an important wake up call. Uh, and if they have a common problem, they've, they put a common name to it, at least the Russians and the Chinese, who write about and wrote a lot in that period about the challenge of deterring and defeating a conventionally superior nuclear armed major power and its allies. And that bears repeating because each element of it has some result in the way they have thought. So deter and defeat a conventionally superior but nuclear armed major power uh, and its allies. Uh, now, this challenge arriving for them, as it did in the 1990s, came at a bad moment for all three of them. Um, China had pursued 
four modernizations, but military modernization was the fourth of the four. The Russian economy, society, and political system was, of course, in complete, complete collapse, along with its military. Uh, and North Korea was similarly struggling through, through a terrible famine uh, and many problems of its own creation. So they didn't have money or technology or, or force structure to throw at this problem. What did they have? Smart people. Uh, and they put together an effort, efforts in the, in the three countries to essentially put their intellectual houses in order on the problem of deterring and defeating a conventionally superior nuclear armed major power and its allies. And over time, they developed a set of ideas, hypotheses, added in some wishful thinking about how to deter and defeat the United States and its allies. Uh, and I, I, I think of this as a, it's not a strategy, a strategy is an ends, ways, means construct. A, th a theory of victory is the ideas that link those things. If I do X, I will get Y outcome because. That's the theory. That's the theoretical part. If I do this, that will happen because. And I think they've developed theories of victory in two senses. In the spirit of Clausewitz. Clausewitz's view of war, of course, was that it was a continuation of politics by other means. And therefore, there's a particular notion of victory that goes with that, which is in his writing, when you bring an enemy to a quote, culminating point where the enemy chooses to no longer run the costs and risks of continued war. But I think they also have a theory of victory in the spirit of Sun Tzu. They believe they're not going to have to put the, the test, put their theories to test in war because they'll be able to subdue us without fighting to break our will by, by various means. Uh, this is a set of ideas about how to achieve their aims while not incentivizing the United States and its allies to use all of the power available to us. This is their core challenge. Uh, it involves coercion, blackmail, brinksmanship, potentially limited attacks on the American homeland but it's not the problem of unrestrained warfare that Chinese scholars wrote about in the 1990s and 2000s and that Russian scholars have written about as well. And the core of the theory of victory shared in a general way across these three countries is first of all, that if war with America appears inevitable, go first, go fast, go hard, create a fait accompli and present America and its allies with the image of a terrible price to be paid. This is very much what Russian nuclear signaling is about today in Europe. But if we choose to try to reverse the fait accompli, then the next element of the theory is to separate allies from each other and from the United States so that the United States is left in a position to fight alone or not at all. Here, the best example is Kim Jong-un, who, who regularly says, if I ever have to employ a nuclear weapon, the first one is going to be dropped on Tokyo. And we Americans hear that and tend to think, well, this is a reflection of the historic grievances in, in the region. No, that misses the point entirely. Uh, the conventional defense of the Republic of Korea would be accomplished in part with forces and capabilities sitting at bases in Japan under the United Nations flag. Their dispatch to the P Republic of Korea requires the approval of the Japanese prime minister. In the 1950s, that was a no brainer. There was no risk. And Kim Jong-un is trying to make it a brainer, trying to impress upon the leadership of Japan to compel them to ask, do you wanna run the risk of 100,000 dead in Tokyo for these people over here that you're not allied with and don't frankly like very much. But if this fails and the alliances are resolved to reverse the fait accompli, the, the, the next main concept is of course to use anti-access area denial 
capabilities to either defeat or at least significantly raise the cost to the United States of power projection. Uh, and if this fails, <clears throat> then you're in a position, then put yourself in a position to remind the American public of its vulnerability, the homeland vulnerability. And this should cause the United States leadership to choose to stop short in considering regime removal as its final objective. Now, when I talk through this way of thinking with Americans, a lot of the American community finds this just implausible. If we're the stronger power, as they've defined it, conventionally superior, nuclear armed with a lot of allies, then there's a simple solution to this problem. We just out escalate them. Um, as some people in the defense community say, we'll just turn them into a glass parking lot if they dare cross any of our red lines. Uh, to which the appropriate response is, that's not going to look like victory to the President of the United States. We got in this mess and we had to turn them into a glass parking lot. Uh, the peace that would follow would not be uh, very congenial from an American perspective. Um, The logic, the final element of their theory of victory that explains their confidence and their ability to asymmetrically disincentivize our counter escalation, their logic is, is very straightforward. They see an asymmetry of stake. The interest, we would have a stake in a war over Taiwan, uh, for example would be very important, numerous, and largely reputational. For China, they would be seen as vital. This gives the Chinese leadership confidence that their threats to escalate would be credible, even if we're the stronger power. Asymmetry, so asymmetry of stake, asymmetry of geography plays a role as well. It would be very difficult for us to reverse a fait accompli against Taiwan or against a Baltic state without touching the territories of the major power aggressors. This opens up the credibility of their threats to attack the American homeland. So there's an asymmetry of various kinds that, uh, that informs their confidence and the credibility of their threat to escalate. Now, I barely mentioned the word nuclear. Uh, nuclear weapons play varying roles in the thinking of Russia, China, and North Korea. And of course, we don't really know precisely what that thinking is at the, at the leadership level. Clearly, Russia has fully integrated nuclear options, actions, and um, capability across this entire range of uh, actions that it might take to, to persuade us not to act. Uh, and precisely where its threshold might be is, is, of course, a matter of conjecture. China has so far put nuclear weapons in a more isolated role, but they seem to be coming out of that corner. As the Well, let me just uh, stop there. And from, from North Korea, I think we have clear signals that, uh, well, they've written in their law that the role of nuclear weapons is to, quote, round out the combat posture. That doesn't say just deterrence. Now, these three countries put their intellectual houses in order. They then went out and developed capabilities, con ops, doctrine. The capabilities are reaching the field. They're being exercised they're developing confidence in the solution that they've put out there. And I think this reinforces their assertiveness in, in the gray zone, so to speak. Where do we stand on this? Well, it was hard to get any attention to these problems back before the annexation of Crimea, which was a wake up call that the United States in the West generally had um, failed to take serious account of all the warning signs coming out of Moscow and Beijing. Uh, and 
since 2014, I would say we've turned the corner. Um, good progress has been made in refocusing on the problems of regional conventional wars against nuclear armed adversaries. The Obama administration took a first major step in this direction with the third offset strategy. But of course, the Trump administration accelerated the refocus with its own national defense strategy. A lot of work is good work has gone into understanding the red theory of victory, how Russia and China in particular uh, have, have applied these concepts in practice. Uh, the services and joint staff are, of course, in, actively engaged in concept development for wars in contested environments. A lot of focus on how to, how to do a better job of integrating multi-domain capabilities for deterrence effects. Lots of progress. But the National Defense Strategy Commission didn't see much to credit in all of that progress. Uh, the National Defense Strategy Commission, less than two years ago, concluded that the progress was essentially not consequential for the scale of the problem that now exists. And they, the, the commission faulted most fundamentally the absence of strategic thought. It said at one point, we're less worried about missing capabilities than in the absence of clear and thinking and agreement across the department's leadership about how to manage escalation, de-escalation, war termination, nuclear coercion, long-term nuclear competition. So I, I want to credit this, the progress that's been made, but I also want people to be mindful of the fact that uh, at least one authoritative group has judged that if put to the test at this time, we would likely fail. So uh, I, I've tried to stir the pot on this. Uh, I, I think uh, we spend a, a lot of time, there are a lot of people participating today who are members of the technology development community uh, in the United States. We play to one of our great strengths when we put the science and technology community in the lead of thinking about the future of warfare. Um, but the technology community alone cannot fully conceive the nature of future warfare and there needs to be uh, a, an interaction with operational concept development, strategic concept development, and an understanding of the strategic level of war as opposed to the operational level of war. And the strategic level of war in the new environment we live in is alarmingly similar, or, or let me put unhelpfully similar to the strategic level of war that we knew in the Cold War and in the 1990s when we were focused on rogue states. Uh, the, the, new, the new problem of the strategic level of war is, is about, it's this problem of coercion, limited war, blackmail, brinkmanship, and circumstances short of war, strategies short of war, aimed at undermining and ultimately undoing the regional security orders we seek to defend. Uh, so uh, with that, let me uh, hope that I put enough uh, provocative comments on the table to start the discussion. Uh, that this, this leaves us plenty of time for Q&A. I thank everybody for, for wanting to join in the discussion and, and look forward to it. Doug, back to you. Uh, sir, I really appreciate that great overview. The, the framework you used there, um, you know, I've heard a lot of talks on these subjects, but that was very effective, and, and so I really appreciate you laying it out like that. I'd like to ask you a few follow-up questions before opening up the, the discussion to the audience. And the first one is, you know, you note that one of the purposes of your study was to restore and sustain focus on the conceptual gaps identified in the 2018 National Defense Strategy Commission Report. Could you elaborate on what the NDS Commission had to say and the, and the topics you raised in this report? I mean, you just hit on some of it, but a little bit more in depth. Sure, thank you. Yeah, the, the, the NDS Commission faulted um, the absence of uh, both thought and, and agreement among DOD leadership. 
about the particular challenges of what then Chairman Dunford called the problem of modern, modern warfare that is multi-dimensional, multi-domain, and trans-regional in character. Uh, and uh, the commission faulted the absence of apparent thinking about what to do if deterrence fails, how to restore it in a matter that incentivizes de-escalation by our adversary rather than escalation. It faulted the absence of thinking about how to successfully terminate a war where an adversary holds a nuclear trump card. Uh, and in general, it found a lack of thought about multi-domain escalation and how it could be managed. Uh, the US defense community still finds it very comfortable to fall back on the language of escalation control. There will be no control. It's a wrong and misleading word. Uh, it's it's uh, escalation management or it's countering the escalatory strategies of our adversaries, but it's not escalation control. Um, and I think, uh, lastly, the, the commission, like the national defense strategy, faulted the atrophy that has gripped the, the US nuclear community and the strategic community generally since the end of the Cold War, um, but saw no evidence of the department taking steps to redress the atrophy uh, after uh, acknowledging it, call, calling it out, highlighting it in the national defense strategy. So that, that touches on some, some of the issues. I appreciate that overview. So, you know, looking at this notion of theory of victory, what do you view as the role of nuclear weapons in Blue's theory of victory? What do they contribute that is particular and unique? So first of all, what they contribute is something particular and unique. Uh, there, there are a lot of additional capabilities we have come to rely on to play a role in strategic deterrence, missile defense, cyber defense and cyber strike, space and counter space, um, conventional strategic strike capability. All, all of these elements have enriched the deterrence toolkit but they are all complements to, but not substitutes for, the role of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, uh, I, I would say, uh, it's been a fairly steady th theme since the end of the Cold War, at least until recently, to um, try to reduce reliance on nuclear weapons to deter in circumstances where we're not sure our own threats are credible. We came to rely on nuclear weapons to play a large role in the 1990s, for example, in deterring rogue state use of chemical and biological weapons. It's not really clear that the threat to employ nuclear weapons is credible in the kinds of scenarios that Saddam and others might have thought about in the 1990s. So we sought to reduce our reliance on nuclear threats by ramping up, in that case, more effective chemical and biological defenses and more effective missile defenses so that the uh, Iraqi CBW couldn't reach our forces. Um, today, the role of nuclear weapons, I think, has been, um, I don't want to say circumscribed. That's the wrong way to put it. It's It's been right-sized to the problem, which is the, the problem posed by states that are capable of jeopardizing the vital interests of the United States or its allies. Um, to make a nuclear threat isn't very credible if the interest that's been put in jeopardy is important, but not vital. Uh, the threat to employ a nuclear weapon is only gonna be credible in a narrow range of circumstances that our adversaries might create for us. And nuclear weapons are uniquely uh, potent as a signal of our willingness, our intent 
to defend our vital interests and those of our allies when they're put at risk. Nothing else will do that for us. That's an interesting point. And uh, again, the nuances there are very, very important and glad you highlighted them. So if we look at our allies, it's often said that a key asymmetric advantage of the United States and great power competition are the partners and allies that we've got. Now, in your view, what is the role of U.S. allies in this new strategic landscape and what role should they play in, in the development of a blue theory of victory? I think it's important to, to stop and talk about allies for, for a few minutes because they don't get the attention they deserve on this topic. Uh, when it comes to the nuclear deterrence community, extended deterrence is sort of an afterthought. Uh, and uh, we'd, be, we'd be much comfortable relying just on our strategic force to do the extended deterrence mission when what our allies really want is, is the allies who are worried about effective extended nuclear deterrence. They, they, they want forward deployable or forward deployed capability. Uh, so I, I find a kind of mismatch between uh, an American community that's oriented one way and allies oriented another. But the two, two, two main points in answer to your question. One, we have to understand that our allies are the main game in the red theory of victory. They're not a means to an end. What the leaders in Russia and China and North Korea are trying to do is to remake the regional security orders in which they sit. They're not gonna wake up one day and launch an all out massive bolt out of the blue strike on the American homeland because they wanna to go to war with the United States. They, they want to remake the regional security orders. What are those orders? They are our allies and they are our alliances. Uh, and thus prying our allies away from us and putting them in a, in a, a sort of murky middle position or drawing them closer to um, our major power challenger uh, is their objective. So they are the main game, not the, not the away game is the first point. And the second point is uh, our allies who are concerned about this problem have a great deal to contribute both conceptually, because they've studied these problems uh, with an urgency in ways we sometimes haven't, and capability-wise. Um, you know, ex extended deterrence used to be something the U.S. provided, the, the umbrella. We would hold the umbrella over Japan and South Korea. The U.S.-Japan alliance and the U.S. ROK alliance now think much more about deterrence as something we do together. Yes, the U.S. provides the nuclear component, but deterrence is something the alliance has to contribute. And, and our allies have to contribute particular capabilities in the case of Japan, for example, missile defense. So uh, our allies are in a sense part of the problem in that they're in the crosshairs and, and they're, part, they're essential to the solution. I appreciate that. So if we look at emerging technologies, you know, obviously they're gonna offer some significant advantages that are new and unique, but focusing on one in particular, where do you see hypersonic weapons fitting into the uh, emerging deterrence toolkit? Well, they're fitting first of all into the emerging deterrence toolkits of China and Russia, uh, who are likely to field capability sooner than we. Uh, and, and in a sense, that's not especially troubling if what they're doing is simply reinforcing existing strategic capabilities. After all, they already are both capable of delivering weapons at hypersonic speeds, just ballistically. On the other hand, if they're integrating them in the service of strategies to attack our command and control capabilities and otherwise engage in very early preemptive action in a rising time of crisis, then these, then these are troubling capabilities. Uh, I see the United States continuing to struggle with defining the mission of the capabilities we're developing. Uh, I think some in our community think of 
hypersonics as the heir to conventional prompt global strike and conventional Trident uh, and, and filling a niche capability in the intercontinental range space. Uh, I see others um, more focused on the regional dimension uh, as a supplement to our um, non-existent intermediate range missile capability in both Europe and Asia, uh, and a potentially significant substitute. Uh, here here the, the hard question is, is it just about rogue states, North Korea and Iran? Is it at the other extreme about Russia? And where does China fit into this picture? The answer to that question will, will have significant implications for the numbers and reach of these systems. Uh, and I don't see that we've settled on uh, answers to those questions. I appreciate that. Look at your center. I understand under the auspices of the Center for Global Security Research, you recently convened a set of workshops assessing whether the strategic posture of 2030 will be fit for purpose. Can you give us a few insights into the results? Sure, we actually convened uh, two back-to-back -back events. One, one was uh, looking at the U.S. nuclear posture in 2030 and beyond. Uh, and the other was looking at the broader strategic posture, uh, missile defense, non-nuclear strike, hypersonics, space and counter space. Uh, and, and for each of these events, we tried to uh, assist the participants to think in terms of a net assessment approach in, in, in a 2030 timeframe. And to ask, are we likely to look back and conclude that we gained or lost position or at least held steady relative to the capabilities of Russia and China. Uh, and the central conclusions were that in the nuclear part of that discussion, um, well, there, the, the, I would say overall the view is one of cautious optimism that by 2030 we, we will believe that we have not lost ground against Russia and China. But the emphasis there would fall on caution rather than optimism. Uh, that, that assumes that everything that has to work just in time in modernizing warheads and delivery systems actually happens just in time. And it also makes the bigger assumption that there will be no new requirement of any kind that national leaders might want to meet. Uh, the infrastructure that's in place to do these things uh, simply is already taxed to the maximum. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't sized and scaled the complex for anything other than life extension. And um, so cautious optimism on the core strategic nuclear relationship. Uh, a more pessimistic read on the extended deterrence relationship and the regional nuclear balances in Europe and East Asia where there seems to be little prospect of improvement to US extended nuclear deterrence capabilities other than the important improvement of the, the improved V61 and uh, the move to the F-35 in a dual capable mode. Uh, that helps restore a degree of um, penetration against advanced air defenses that, that's valuable for deterrence. But we can see those integrated in air and missile defenses in both Europe and Asia becoming much more robust. Uh, and we can see uh, a very substantial asymmetry of nuclear capability in Europe. Uh, and we see Chinese nuclear modernization in North Korea developing a regional missile force. So the conclusion by 2030 on the extended deterrent piece was more pessimistic. And on the other pieces, so we ran the, the workshop under the title Fit for Purpose. We know what our purpose is with nuclear weapons and are more or less agree about it nationally. But the 2030 purpose of missile defense, of counter space capability, of as I just discussed, hypersonic capabilities, uh, the questions of basic purpose are in some sense still unsettled. And so it's hard to know if we will be 
if the capability will be fit. Uh, I, la lastly, one, one, one particular argument, I, I wrote the piece on missile defense uh, and my, my core argument is that uh, the problem we've been trying to solve with missile defense, which I defined as the Goldilocks problem, which is we'd like a missile defense large enough to negate the deterrence of rogue states, but not jeopardize strategic stability with Russia and China. As North Korea goes to 50 or 100 or more, that sweet spot's going to disappear. And we can either chase the major powers, which is the direction that many in the policy community would like to go, to say that missile defense is about Russia and China. Uh, or alternatively, we can uh, say that the purpose is to negate the coercion strategies and blackmail strategies and thus to, to take the cheap shots off the table by any actor, rogue state or major power. Uh, so again, there's a strategic choice to be made that, that we're not really seeing as we simply move through the technology development work. That last point is, is really interesting and uh, yeah. So looking at China and their nuclear weapons, there are several noteworthy items in the Pentagon's most recent report to Congress on China's military power. The assessment that China maintains an operational nuclear warhead stockpiled in the low 200s is smaller than has widely been assumed, but the report also projected that China would double the size of their nuclear stockpile and is on the cusp of achieving a triad of delivery systems. How do you see these developments in the context of China's theory of victory? Well, that's an excellent question. And um, for me, the China military power report brought out how much is in flux in China's um, capabilities and, and how many new questions there are about China's nuclear intent. Um, the theory of victory, as I understand it, is about blackmail and brinksmanship. And um, uh, in China's case, um, a strong adherence to no first use, yes, some very important caveats, and launch on, launch on warning may be a step away from no first use. Some people read it as a large step. I'm not sure that it is. but. Um, China's view has been that it needs to be credibly capable of delivering only a very small number of nuclear weapons onto the United States to induce our restraint and to be seen to be free of American bullying. Mao famously said China got nuclear weapons to smash nuclear bullying and he was talking about us. Um, and I think that idea remains strong in, in their, their nuclear culture. But um, they're clearly moving away from the culture of minimum deterrence and towards something um, more substantial, more ambitious. Uh, they're, they're not seeking parity in a quantitative way with the United States. They believe back when they had 20, and we had 12,000 or so that they had parity because they believed they had a relationship of mutual nuclear vulnerability with the United States. Uh, so they define parity as the quality of mutual vulnerability, at least their military dictionary does. I don't see them moving to quantitative parity on the basis of military arguments. Maybe there would be political arguments to do so associated with emerging as a global dominant power in 2049. But qualitatively, they're, they've become much more like a peer. Their nuclear force is, is becoming a triad. It's gaining advanced, new, new warning capability, advanced command and control. Uh, apparently, we'll have some ability to launch on warning, to operate at alert. This has a peer-like quality, and, and at the time that they are, that the PLA is moving to more 
conventional power projection in distant regions and playing a more uh, and doing more operational planning for regional contingencies. This, this, is, this, is, this, this implies that something has shifted in Beijing. I wish I knew what it were. Yeah. So a little bit of a follow-up. The Pentagon's report also raises the issue of China's ambiguity regarding their no first use policy. Could you please provide us with your perspective on this? I, the, um, <clears throat> there's a, there, where to start? There, there is, um, there's always been some ambiguity about no first use. Um, Mao is reported to have said early in China's nuclear history that of, that of course, if we're invaded by the Soviets, our use of nuclear weapons on our territory to defeat the Soviets would not be a violation of our promise not to use nuclear weapons first against another country. We'd be exploding them on our territory. Now, if you ask a Chinese diplomat today, how does that apply to Taiwan? You get a, a silence. Well, you're left, uh, you're left to speculate. Uh, th there's been ambig ambiguity too, and uh, they've had a long running debate, 15 years <clears throat> about the combined impact of our conventional strike capability and our missile defense capability. Does it, does it strip away the credibility of their threat to retaliate? Uh, and, and if it does, do they find solutions by altering declaratory policy or by altering the technical basis that makes them vulnerable? And for 15 years, it seems that the leadership chose the latter. Uh, certainly, <clears throat> Uh, 10 years ago, a ch uh, abandonment of no first use or a conditioning no first use was just dismissed by the leadership as unacceptable because it was inconsistent with the message of China's peaceful rise. Um, now the move to launch on warning for a, for a small part of the, the force, the force that would be vulnerable to a preemptive strike by the United States or Russia or, or India, uh, the move to a launch on warning uh, raises a question about whether China has abandoned no first use, conditioned no first use, or sees this as consistent with no first use. Launch on warning means you've been attacked, it's just the weapons haven't delivered. So they tend to argue that launch on warning is not inconsistent with their promise to not use nuclear weapons first. So this is another topic that's difficult to understand in a closed system where we're, which is devoted to in information management with the outside world. Um, we don't know if what we're being told privately by people in Beijing is true or is just what's convenient for the regime to have them tell us. Looking elsewhere in the globe, Russia maintains a significant arsenal of non-strategic nuclear weapons, including a large and diverse set of dual capable systems. How do these technologies factor into their theory of victory and what are the plausible scenarios for Russian nuclear use of short or use use short of a large scale strategic exchange? Right. Well, Russia's theory of victory has the word nuclear in every every sentence. Um, I don't think that means that uh, Russia embraces uh, large-scale nuclear war fighting as a, as a winning strategy. Um, but it wants us to understand that it, it can employ nuclear force in any way against any target by any of its available strike means. And we have to reckon with that. This is a part of establishing our expectation that trying to reverse their fait accompli would be highly costly. Um, I think they, they're, certainly their military scholars write about the employment of, well, there's a general category of strategic operations called SADSID, strategic operations to destroy critically important targets. 
and their scholars write about the employment of both conventional and nuclear weapons in support of SADSIT operations. And one has written about the employment of nuclear weapons in regional wars, as opposed to all out major conflagration, conflagration with, with the United States, but in regional wars in order to quote, sober, but not enrage the West. Sober us, he meant to wake us up to that asymmetry of stake that I mentioned earlier, but not enrage because we realize, because we am, Americans and Europeans would realize that we're better off being restrained than enraged because of what might happen if, we, if we're enraged. We might bear a terrible further reply. So some, some people look at Russian military thought and Russian nuclear capabilities and conclude this is all fairly benign and that it's all about deterrence and defense. And others say, well, they're pursuing a, a fairly aggressive strategy and, and coercion, nuclear and otherwise, is central to that strategy, so it's not benign. Uh, I, I tend more to the, to the latter view. Uh, and I think if it came to war and a Russian choice about employing nuclear weapons, the voice of the military would be heard, but the decision would be made by President Putin and the people around him at the table who, who are not people who share the history of, in their gut awareness of the devastation of World War II. They're risk takers. They believe in bold action. They believe the West is a paper tiger. Uh, I think we have the makings of a very dangerous situation. Well, sir, I appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts with us today. On behalf of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, we wish you the very best in this era of ever increasing challenges. Now, as a reminder to our listener, our next event will be tomorrow, Tuesday, September 22nd, when Chief of Space Operations General Jay Raymond and NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine will join us for our Space Power Forum. So with that, we're now gonna open the session to our questions from the audience who've been listening to our conversation. As a reminder to our viewers, you can participate in the Q&A by using the raise hand function on your device. And when I call on you, before asking your question, please unmute your mic and state your name and affiliation for our guest. You can also submit a question in writing using the Q&A function. So with that, we're going to uh, try some here on Q&A. So the first one up is from Tom Earhart. And he says, it has been my observation that the U.S. defense establishment's nuclear IQ has decreased dramatically since the end of the Cold War in two ways. First, we failed to educate newer generations about the deep and comprehensive literature on that issue developed during the Cold War. Second, more distressing, we are failing to apply even elementary principles to our modern geopolitical and technological state environment. What is CGSR doing to turn around the situation? Thank you, Tom. Uh, I mean, in general, I agree, agree with the argument about nuclear IQ. My sense of it is that that bottomed out uh, and that really the, um, the mistransit of uh, a weapon to Minot in 2006 and the subsequent Schlesinger panel findings about the loss of leadership focus and loss of service and other commitment to institutional excellence, turned turn the corner, bottomed out. Um, still, it's very difficult to find evidence of nuclear focus in the professional military educational system. Uh, and it's still common for almost everybody outside Stratcom to say, if, the, if, if we got a nuclear problem here, we'll call Stratcom. Over to them, uh, which is a wishing away of the whole problem of regional, of nuclear weapons and coercive roles in regional conflicts. Um, the center I direct is trying to um, stimulate uh, renewed strategic thought. Uh, we bring together diverse um, expertise from around the world to explore these issues. We, we haven't put a focus on nuclear exactly. We've put a focus on strategic. 
uh, and to try to help find the place of nuclear in its in proper perspective. The nuclear problem today is not the problem of the Cold War, as I argued er earlier. It's unhelpfully similar to the Cold War problem. It's unhelpfully similar in the sense that there are elements that are similar, and so we sort of ignore the differences. Uh, and a part of what we're trying to do at CGSR is bring out the, the, the unique roles of nuclear weapons today. Uh, we're also trying to advance the discussion of nuclear risk reduction uh, in productive and tangible ways. But thank you, Tom, for the question. Okay, next up, uh, we've got one from General Kowalski. Recently, both Admiral Richard and General Ray have publicly brought attention to the growth in the quality and quantity of Chinese nuclear arsenals. What impacts do you see on U.S. strategy? Should China become more of a nuclear peer with the U.S. and Russia? Well, I think China's pretty close to being a nuclear peer. And in, in the sense, I argued, it's moved from a monad to a triad. It's moved from, from a force that can't be alerted to a force with an, uh, an early warning and other command and control capabilities. Um, <clears throat> It's moving to more diverse capability. It's got um, a significant regional component. Uh, it's uh, so, and, and it's thinking about how to pursue regional contingencies under the under the nuclear shadow. These are these are all. all qualities that, that lend it peer status. Quantitatively, no, it's a long way away. But as I argued, that, that's not the important metric from China's perspective, at least from, from the perspective of military uh, strategy and capability. Uh, I think f fun, at, at, a, at a very simple level, the answer to your question is, is um, we need to stop treating China as a footnote. Uh, in, in, the, in the small community of people that think about matters nuclear, most think about Russia, some think about rogue states, and China has been an afterthought. Uh, and um, so first point is to take seriously China as a factor in US nuclear strategy. Uh, the second, I think, is to become much more uh, assertive. I don't want to say aggressive because I think that's not the right point, but assertive in pressing China on all of the ways in which its behaviors in the nuclear domain are troubling to us. It believes it's, it's pursuing, uh, claims to believe that it's pursuing a, a fundamentally benign nuclear strategy that we're the ones whose actions perturb the stability of the strategic relationship. And there are actions of ours that have perturbed strategic stability. Uh, but they've got a lot of explaining to do. Uh, and uh, they have refused to accept any invitation uh, except the informal ones in which you, you and I have participated uh, for, for strategic dialogue. And, and I think we need a presidential level commitment to proceed with some substantial, sustained, high level dialogue uh, on all of these questions. I mean, I, I don't imagine beyond that any particular change to our nuclear strategy. I mean, we're not going to endorse no first use as they would wish we might. Um, I don't think we're going to engage in a nuclear arms race in East Asia to counterbalance their capability. Um, but there, there, there's a broader discussion to be had here about the role of integrated strategic deterrence, the roles of cyber and missile defense and counter space, et cetera, in, in meeting the challenge that China presents today. Doug, back to you. Sir, we've got uh, David Anhalt here online. Uh, sir, if you could uh, join us. Yes, just unmuting there. Uh, my question is, uh, you, you, you have made uh, some points about the fact that management of escalation and de-escalation and war termination 
are uh, very important issues that uh, involve the operational use of nuclear weapons uh, and maybe even the actual use of them. Uh, in what ways do you think that that management problem of escalation, de-escalation, and war termination are different today than during the Cold War? And if it is different, how should those differences be reflected in the modernization of the nuclear command and control system, the NC3 system? Well, I think it's different in a number of ways. And um, uh, you've asked uh, an excellent and very wide ranging question and I, I won't do it justice, but let me say, I think a, a, a couple of the key differences are that one, the assumption in the Cold War was that if we entered the nuclear phase of conflict, we would be doing so with our command and control systems for nuclear war intact. Uh, and we would expect them to ser serve us well in the period of the, the, the urgent need to act quickly as we, as we would be under a large scale attack. Uh, and in um, the present circumstance, the pathway to nuclear employment is likely to be arising out of a regional contingency which has gone badly for an adversary who in the language of the last administration tries to escalate its way out of a failed act of conventional aggression uh, to sober but not enrage us to cite the Russian author. Uh, and, um, uh, and would come to this point after a long period or at least a period of conventional warfare in which multiple assets on the ground and in space will have been struck, some of which will be a part of our command and control system. So the implication for command and control is twofold. One, um, um, it, we, we can no longer assume that we'll enter the nuclear phase of conflict with the system intact. And, and secondly, the, the communication that would be requir required that the that the system should enable would be qualitatively different. So in the, in the Cold War, the communication that needed to happen quickly was the communication between the commander in chief and the STRATCOM commander. In the scenario that I think presents itself today, uh, a regional challenger isn't going to be acting in ways to provoke our large scale retaliation. He's going to be acting in a way to try and make us deliberate wait, pause and think. Uh, and what's the presidential response likely to be? To want to deliberate with a lot of actors. Uh, so the, the command and control capability, the implication here is the command and control capability needs to be embedded in a national leadership command and control co and communication system that would enable the president to speak with the leader of the allied country under threat, the head of NATO, um, the leaders of Russia and China and the other nuclear weapon states, the UN Secretary General, et cetera, et cetera. Those would not all be command and control decisions, but they would be central to the communication then underway that would need to be effective despite the preceding damage to the command and control system done in a la large scale conventional war. Hope that addresses your question, Dave. Yes, thank you very much. That uh, shines a light on it very well. well. Sir, we've come to the end of our time block. So thanks again uh, for your being with us today and your thoughts, very, very impressive. To our audience, uh, thanks from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute and wish you all a great aerospace day.